please be seated. So is anybody familiar with those books that you might have seen when you were a kid called arch books and they were sort of Bible stories that rhymed? You might have heard the one that was about the text that we heard this morning. It was called, um, they, they titled the story, He Remembered to Say Thank You. It was one of my favorite arch books and um, it seemed to really resonate with my parents who really believed in thank you notes. And so I, I felt like it was a, a good biblical reminder of the importance to remember to say thank you. And I will admit that I have at times said thank you for things I couldn't remember what I was given. But I was younger. <laughs> I want to suggest to you this morning that there's a whole lot more going on in this story than simply one person who remembered to say thank you. I want to suggest to you this morning that Jesus is answering a very fundamental question. And the question is, Am I going to survive? Am I going to survive? Am I going to survive because I have had leprosy and been kicked out of my community and I'm barely making it and I'm watching my body go downhill and I am seeing the separation and feeling so acutely that I do not belong? Am I going to survive? We've all had that question go through our minds at, from time to time. But we all know that there are people in this world who are acutely asking that question, who are acutely aware of their perilous circumstances. So I want us to like, think about this with you, okay? So here's the deal. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And what that means is code for Jesus is on his way to not surviving. And he knows it. He knows that he is on a path that is going to lead him to the complete judgment of the culture, to the, the being crucified because he is not conforming, because he is not who he needs to be to survive. So he's got that on his mind and he goes into this village and he sees these nine people with leprosy. He obviously saw them. There's no need for the author to have said he saw them because if, if they're introduced into the story, we all see them. We see them 2,022 years later. So certainly Jesus saw them. He saw them. And the implication is that not only did he see them because they walked up and they were yelling and they were desperate, he saw them in the fullness of the question. Am I going to survive? And Jesus attended to them, and we all know that he said, go, show yourselves to the priest, and they went. Well, we also, if you know a little bit about the history of Palestine, the ancient Near East, the Roman occupation of, of Israel, and the way in which the temple and Rome became bed partners, to say go show yourself to the priest means a few things, right? It means go and follow the law because that's what you're supposed to do. These people with leprosy were obedient. They didn't run up and touch Jesus. They stayed at a distance and they begged for healing. And when Jesus said go show yourself to the priest, he was honoring the law that they needed to show their cleansing to the priest. They didn't have it yet. They got it on the way, but they were on their way to do that very thing, to show that they were clean. And doing that to, with that cultural paradigm means that those 10 people that left, at least nine of them were following the culture that they had been shaped and formed into. They were going into the ways in which they had always known to do. But one of them, was not Jewish. One of them received that healing, he flipped and he turned back and he went back to Jesus. And when that happens, if you notice in the text, he saw that he had been healed and he turned and went back to Jesus. Gonna take a little break right there. 
hold that in your head. Nine are headed down to the temple to be presented to the priest, to go show their healing to the priest. And one turns back to Jesus. They all were asking the question, how will I survive? Right after World War II, when the soldiers came home, these veterans of this tremendous war who had given themselves all that they had, had suffered tremendous trauma, 10 of them came home to the United States. Nine of them were veterans with white skin, and one was a veteran with dark skin. They were all suffering from post-traumatic stress, from whatever awfulness they had experienced. But the question, will I survive, shifted right at the moment of getting back on American soil. Nine of them were back in a culture that said, we're here, we welcome you, Tinker Tape Parade, you are a full citizen. One arrived back, and the question, will I survive, remained as acute and profound as it had been on the battlefield. Another example. Ten people go to the bank, and they want to buy their first home, and they've got $20,000 in the bank ready to put it down. Nine of them walk into the bank, and the culture is theirs. They're the people that are pictured on the commercials. They're the people that are given, you know, mom and dad, no problem. They got their mortgage. They got their loan. They could get it wherever they wanted. One of them walked into the bank, and they couldn't get the loan. Or when they got the loan, it was for that area. It was for this level of interest. The question, will I survive, continued to be important in that context in a way that once you got the money and will I get the house, wasn't. Are you with me? Are you seeing it? We could take 10 people, put them in different contexts, and we could always name the one for whom the question, will I survive, is still there. And you know what? This seems to be the one that Jesus welcomed and offered something to that those nine, they got healed. They got healed. But something else was there that they had not been able to name and receive. So this one guy, he turns around and he goes back to Jesus. He saw that he was healed. And he turns and he runs back and he's glorifying God in a loud voice. How much you want to bet if you were a Samaritan living with nine guys who were not in your culture or men and women, people who were not in your culture, that you'd be pretty quiet most of the time because you're pretty much outnumbered. But now he is praising God in a loud voice. Something has happened to this guy. He sees that there is hope. He has seen that there's something about him that can be changed, that there is, oh, there's a ray of light I'm going back. I'm going to find that light. I'm going to lay down in front of him and I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to glorify God because there's an answer to will I survive and it's yes. It is yes. It is you are a person. You matter. It may look like the whole culture is ignoring you and whether you live or die is irrelevant, but Jesus says no. You your life is important. Your healing is the first step to your wholeness. And that guy received it. Jesus did something that is unique and revolutionary that is so easy to overlook. You know what it was? You're going to scoff at me when I say I mean, it's so simple. He saw the humanity of every single person. He named it. He lifted it up. And he said, there is a way to live in this world so that you are free and whole and it doesn't matter even if you are the one at the bottom. Even if you are the invisible person. Even if your transition from one gender to another just brings everybody into your hate zone. Even if you change your name to something weird. Even if you are from a different country and you're not here with a state ID. You belong. Your voice is important. Lift it. And it wasn't about revolution. 
It wasn't about take all that anger at the way the country and the nation and the culture is hurting you and go raise your revolutionary flag and do some violence. It was own who you are and act in love. It's revolutionary. It changed this man. It changed us. It changed the world. The simplest powerful thing of knowing that you are a human being loved and beloved by God, belonging in this world, regardless of what the culture tells you, that you can survive because your identity is not going to get snuffed out by a culture that tro throws hate at it. Because your identity doesn't matter in this world, it matters to God. And you are loved and beloved by God. So here's how Howard Thurman, the mystic, the theologian, an amazing mentor to Dr. Martin Luther King, here's what he said. And I'm going to put it as if this is the example for our number one guy who got healed, okay? Jesus showed him the glory of his own possibilities. Jesus showed that leper who had been healed, who moved and came back. He didn't just see that his skin was clean. He saw that he had possibilities he had never dreamed of. Jesus showed them to him. And then God whispered into his heart, you belong to me. And the man's response was, thank you. Thank you, God. I pray and hope that we who tend toward being of the nine, I don't imagine most of us are feeling like the question, will I survive, is one that you have chronically had to have in our culture. But I pray that nevertheless you've had that moment when that question came to you, that you knew you would because of your life in Christ. And I pray that we are all moving towards recognizing the humanity and dignity of every person so that we can do what Jesus did, which is say, you can be whole, you belong, you matter, and not let one single person stay invisible. That's our call as the church. That's what it's all about. It's not partisan. It's not ideological. It is theological. It's God's heart is love. Let us beloved, love one another, and give God great thanks for the power of transformation that comes through that love.